Okay, in this second video on the pituitary gland, um, we're going to focus on both the anterior and the posterior pituitary hormones in more detail. We'll go through all the major ones, look at their um, stimulation for secretion, what inhibits their secretion, their receptors, their general concentrations in the blood, and so forth. So we'll start with uh, the anterior pituitary hormones and growth hormone. And as I mentioned in the last video, this is actually about 40%, even in adults, of the total hormone secreted by the pituitary gland. So we can think of this as one of the major pituitary hormones. That said, in adults, it's actually only secreted during very specific times during the day, uh, actually during the night, during sleep, uh, during what's called slow wave sleep. So that's your major time when growth hormone is secreted. Neonates, um, newborns are in that slow wave sleep state almost 22, 23 hours a day. So they're releasing large amounts of growth hormone then. Um, it's released by the somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary in response to GNRH. And I mentioned somatostatin is the main inhibitor. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, the secretion occurs in kind of large pulses packets each day. Again, this diminishes with age and it diminishes with the amount of slow wave sleep that we get. So for adolescents, we secrete about 700 micrograms a day uh, versus in healthy adults, it goes down to about 400 micrograms per day. Um, various things that release growth hormone would be hyper, hypoglycemia, fasting, increased glucagon from the pancreas, and ghrelin. Um, so this is where fasting states or caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, actually can increase your growth hormone secretion. Strenuous exercise can release growth hormone. Uh, again, deep sleep, slow wave sleep is one of the primary uh, times when we release growth hormone. Uh, remember with sleep, the slow wave sleep happens usually within the first 30 minutes of falling asleep. We go from beta brain wave states, very active, down into alpha. Uh, down into theta, and then down into delta. And both low theta and delta are called slow wave sleep. And we only stay there for about 10 minutes. And then we go back up to REM sleep, which interestingly, REM sleep is at beta brainwave frequencies. And uh, in beta brainwaves, you're actually releasing stress hormones and everything else. So a lot of people think REM is really the time when we, uh, the good part of sleep, when we really renourish and so forth. It's actually not true. The REM sleep is when we consolidate memories. We really do uh, reconnection with different synapses in the brain, but it's the slow wave sleep. And this is when we release growth hormone together with other anabolic hormones like DHEA uh, that we repair and regenerate. We go from REM back to slow wave sleep, uh, back down and then back up again. And we do that about three, four times up to five times a night. Usually it's the first two times down, and we again stay in these states for about 10 minutes, uh, that we get the most repair and regeneration from sleep, and especially if you go to sleep before midnight. Um, so this is why I'm going to make a big emphasis on sleep hygiene uh, as part of a lifestyle adjustment we can help patients with, because this has tremendous roles, not just with melatonin like we usually think, but also with the release of growth hormone. Um, Estrogen in physiologic levels can augment uh, growth hormone release as do androgens in, in puberty. Also things like vitamin B3 and interestingly nicotine in small amounts, although that's not why we should recommend smoking for that reason. Um, again, secretion is the greatest about one hour after sleep onset during the first or second slow wave uh, sleep cycle. And that's about 50% of our total growth hormone secretion. Um, if we get sleep deprivation, we interrupt that sleep, we interrupt our growth hormone release. Uh, and the frequency and amplitude of the pulses of release actually decline, as I said, with age. The inhibitors would be somatostatin, uh, and there are somatostatin analogs. So one of them is called octreotide. These are taken uh, by injection subcutaneously. Um, and these would be used for uh, growth hormone disorders where we are over secreting growth hormone. And that can happen with a pituitary tumor called the pituitary adenoma. Um, and that can lead to in uh, children, something called pituitary gigantism. We'll look at that in detail. Uh, or in adults, acromegaly. So we'll come back to that in a second here. Um, hyperglycemia, overeating, all of that will suppress growth hormone. So do stress hormones, cortisol. Uh, 
Um, so if we look at how do we naturally support growth hormone release beyond giving growth hormone injections, which I'll talk about that here in just a second, um, we should really emphasize good sleep, uh, exercise, you know, good nutrition, and stress reduction. Um, so all of those would be kind of our foundation stones for improving growth hormone secretion. The plasma levels in adults are less than 10 nanograms per milliliter. In children, it's usually less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. And the half-life is only about a half an hour on growth hormone. Uh, the target tissues are primarily liver at first, and that the liver then releases IGF-1, uh, insulin growth factor 1 in response, and that has the major effects on muscle, fat, bone, and the immune system. So the actions are primarily anabolic to increase protein synthesis, organ growth, and muscle hyperplasia, increases height in childhood uh, via increasing the chondrocytes, so causing the cartilage to grow more quickly. And remember that um, the ossification of cartilage is what leads to bone formation. Um, and then increasing lipolysis, so we think uh, growth hormone has a positive effect on keeping body excess body weight off, so it puts all the energy into muscle mass and uh, not into fat storage. Um, increases serum glucose, which could be a problem if in excess that can lead to diabetes. Uh, for example, in that growth hormone secreting tumor I just mentioned, um, diabetes uh, can be a result of that. Um, increases gluconeogenesis, which is the production of new glucose from the liver, uh, from lactate, from uh, glucogenic amino acids, um, and uh, from uh, glycerol, from uh, triglycerides. And it also opposes the action of insulin. So it can induce insulin resistance in excess states. Uh, increases immune response, again, in physiologic levels, and increases bone density via calcium retention, especially in um, when we're younger. So usually under 25, 30 is when growth hormone really uh, has its effects. After that, it's the sex hormones, which really increase bone density. So a lot of people will talk about osteoporosis in depth, but a lot of people think osteoporosis is a mineral deficiency, low calcium, that sort of thing. It's actually not. We get plenty of minerals. It's the hormone stimulation to the osteoblasts, the cells that build the bone, which is lacking. In early life, that's largely growth hormone, a little bit of thyroid hormone, uh, versus in later life, it's primarily the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone. Uh, there is replacement therapy for growth hormone. It has to be done by injection. So this is a peptide, you can't eat it. Um, so you have to inject it. Um, growth hormone therapy is usually reserved for cases of uh, decreased growth hormone, and this is known as pituitary dwarfism in children. Um, so in children without enough growth hormone, the bones will not elongate, the muscle mass will not develop properly, so the body doesn't get to its full form. Um, so that's one of the primary uses of growth hormone injections. It's very controversial to use it for growth hormone insufficiency in adults. So if you look at the literature, a lot of people talk about, you know, low growth hormone in adults can lead to lethargy, increased fat, especially abdominal fat, uh, fatigue, low muscle mass, premature aging, etc. And so there are people out there that are promoting growth hormone injections for that reason. Um, the medical guideline committees are pretty clear on this, including the naturopathic guideline committees that argue we should not be giving growth hormone injections for those patients because of all the potential adverse risks of diabetes, hypertension is another, and then potentially cancer growth because you're giving an anabolic hormone to cancer cells, what's that gonna do that could potentially increase their growth? So uh, growth hormone insufficiency states in adults is probably best addressed with the sleep, exercise, good nutrition. Uh, we can talk about uh, adaptogens, potentially herbal adaptogens as an approach there as well. Um, so that would be for decreased growth hormone states. Increased growth hormone would be again in children and this often happens from a uh, growth hormone secreting tumor in the pituitary. Uh, in children, we might get excess growth hormone causing pituitary gigantism. And then in adults, once the epiphyseal plates in the ends of the bones have fused, uh, adults will no longer grow in height like children will, uh, but they will uh, grow their jaw bones, their hands and feet will continue to grow and they get very large and very thick. Uh, and that's known as acromegaly. Um, 
So acromegaly would be the adult version of increased growth hormone. Um, and the main treatment for this would be to try to, you know, remove the tumor, and we'll talk about that in the pathology section, uh, or to give the somatostatin analog, the octreotide, uh, by injection to inhibit that. All right, so those are the main disorders and a little overview of growth hormone. Next, let's look at ACTH released by corticotropes or corticotrophs. You'll see both written in the literature. Um, the hypophysiotropic hormone, the releasing hormone is CRH um, and uh, also known as corticotropin releasing factor. Um, when these hormones are first discovered, they're usually labeled as factors. And then as we get more confirmation that this is the actual releasing hormone, they change the name to hormones. So some of the older literature uses the word factor. Uh, but CRH stimulates the cortical tropes to release, again, POMC. And uh, POMC is cleaved into a variety of what are called melanocortins, ACTH being one of them, but also alpha MSH, beta lipotropin, beta endorphin, etc. I won't go through all those here. Um, so that's where we get, in, in addition to ACTH, all these others are released uh, in response to CRH. Uh, ACTH is released in a pulsatile rhythm. There's a 24-hour circadian rhythm. The highest uh, levels are, are in the morning. Now, the effect of this hormone, of course, is going to go to the adrenals to release cortisol and DHEA. As cortisol levels go up from the adrenals, they should feed back to the hypothalamus to turn down the secretion of CRH. Um, and CRH itself is going to be released um, in uh, response to stress, to chronic pain, inflammation, and we should also put on here, we now know insulin resistance will also cause release of uh, CRH. So um, all those things will trigger the initial release, but the cortisol should feed back to turn that down. Interestingly, we know in a lot of people now with chronic stress, what happens is the receptors for cortisol in the hypothalamus, the glucocorticoid receptors, down-regulate. And unfortunately, what happens then is that the hypothalamus is no longer able to properly sense the amount of cortisol in the blood. And this is what causes what I referred to earlier as the HPA axis dysregulation, where normally you should get a spike of cortisol in the morning, then it should drop down throughout the day. So by evening, you should have very low cortisol so you can get to sleep. What happens in HPA dysregulation is we might not get that spike in the morning, but we get another surge maybe at 11 a.m., it drops maybe really low in the afternoon, and then it surges again maybe at 9 p.m., and now you can't get to sleep. Um, that's a classic pattern of HPA axis dysregulation. Again, people used to call that adrenal fatigue, uh, and we really shouldn't use that name except for Addison's disease, which is um, you know when the, you actually get low cortisol uh, from the adrenals. You might have low cortisol at specific time points during the day, but over a 24-hour period, your cortisol is still normal, in the HPA axis dysregulation. A lot of criticism of naturopaths in the literature about that term, uh, adrenal fatigue. So really we need to be more accurate. And if you want to find the research literature around this kind of stuff, and there's a lot of it out there, for example, with depression, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all of these are related to HPA axis dysregulation to some degree. Um, use that term in your PubMed searches, HPA axis dysregulation, not adrenal fatigue. Um, and we'll see actually that with HPA axis dysregulation, we can be dysregulated in two ways. And this will be more of a discussion for the adrenal section. We can have, for example, a very, very high cortisol awakening response, too high. You, you wake up from bed with anxiety. And that we might say is an overactive HPA axis versus a uh, low cortisol awakening response. That would be more of an underactive and both of them can be treated with herbal adaptogens. One of the things we know about adaptogens is they can upregulate those glucocorticoid receptors. So they make you more sensitive to cortisol. Let me say that again. The adaptogens don't work primarily on the adrenals. They work on the hypothalamus. Um, and they upregulate the glucocorticoid receptors. Um, and there's really, based on the high or low HPA axis, you can have two different sets of adaptogens. One set of adaptogens, like the ginsengs, can actually raise your cortisol awakening response and increase the HPA access at the right times during the day. 
versus uh, people that have an overactive cortisol awakening response, a lot of anxiety and so forth, they actually need what I would call, it's not a great name, I might call them sedative adaptogens in that they um, can decrease the HPA axis. And ashwagandha would be a good point. So in many ways, ashwagandha and Panax ginseng are opposites. And a lot of people get that confused. And if you look at a lot of the products on the market for adaptogens, they just put them all together in the same bottle. Uh, but I find clinically it's important to kind of tease those apart. So we'll go through the different adaptogens, especially in the adrenal section, and we'll talk about uh, the differences there. But that's very important because um, this is a very, very common phenomena that we see in practice uh, with patients that are under a lot of stress and so forth. Okay, so that's the uh, stimulators for release. Uh, hopefully, again, the cortisol should negatively feed back to uh, downregulate. And we'll talk about a test that can be done for assessing adrenal function in the case of Addison's or Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. And that would be something called the dexamethasone suppression test. So dexamethasone is a synthetic cortical steroid, very long half-life. Uh, very powerful, and you inject this, or you have, you have, sorry, you have a person take it orally, and that should suppress your ACTH secretion from the pituitary. If you have a pituitary tumor, though, it might continue to secrete. So that would be a way we can actually assess uh, pituitary adenomas that are over-secreting ACTH. Uh, there are a number of medications that block cortisol synthesis, which will be used for excess states, like in Cushing's syndrome. Or Cushing's disease, and that would be ketoconazole, which is an antifungal, interestingly, that blocks the synthesis in high dose of glucocorticoids. Uh, materapone also blocks the synthesis, and mitotane is an adrenolytic. It destroys the adrenal gland. Um, those are kind of end-stage, level four therapies. Uh, we'll talk about those later. Plasma half-life, um, uh, I'm sorry, the plasma levels of of ACTH is very small, 10 to 60 picograms per milliliter at the highest point, which should be in the morning around 6 to 8 a.m. Uh, the half-life is only about 10 minutes in the blood. The target tissues of ACTH, um, there's a specific uh, binding uh, receptor. Uh, that's the MC2R. Uh, it's a G-protein receptor, and um, that is located in the adrenals. In the uh, So the adrenal cortex really has three regions. There's an outer region, uh, the glomerulosa. There's a middle region called, I'll just abbreviate that, G. A middle region called the fasciculata. And then an inner region called the reticularis. And then underneath that is the medulla. So the adrenal, uh, the cortisol comes primarily from the fasciculata. Um, and there's some other glucocorticoids like corticosterone I won't talk about here. And reticularis primarily secretes DHEA. And it's the glomerulosa that secretes the aldosterone. Uh, and uh, the ACTH works primarily on the, let's see if I can do it in a little color here, uh, on the fasciculata in the reticularis on these regions. And again, renin is going to be uh, the primary stimulator for aldosterone release. So these receptors for ACTH are found in those regions. Uh, but there are also receptors on osteoblast and bone, as well as skin and adipose. Um, also in the GI tract, and this is, that would be a much longer discussion, but we now know that CRH and ACTH actually have a lot of negative effects on GI mucosa and so forth. So for irritable bowel, uh, and whatnot. We know that overactivation of the HPA axis can really create havoc uh, in the GI system. So that's one thing I always look at with my uh, IBS patients is what's going on uh, with the HPA axis. So the main effects of um, ACTH would be to stimulate cortisol and DHEA synthesis. And the main effects of cortisol, we'll go into that in a lot more detail, but just very simply, cortisol is primarily a catabolic hormone increases your glucose, that's why it's called a glucocorticoid, uh, through various mechanisms like gluconeogenesis and lipolysis. Uh, it decreases immune response and decreases tissue healing and repair. Basically, it gets you primed to run away from a danger or to fight. Um, it's going to turn down all the repair and uh, nutritive processes in the body during that phase. Uh, DHEA, which is secreted in a lot higher levels in cortisol, uh, some say 10 times more, up to 40 times more in some cases. And in fact, most DHEA is actually sulfated 
in the blood, so we call that DHEA sulfate, DHEAS. Um, this is a primarily anabolic hormone. It opposes the catabolic effects of cortisol. So we'll get into this later, but a very important measure is looking at the cortisol to DHEA ratio. And uh, with age and with stress, what we see happens is the cortisol levels go up, but the DHEA levels go down. So the ratio actually goes up with time and that puts you more in a catabolic mode. Um, and so it's the catabolic activities that we get more and more with the stress. Um, so again, we'll get into that later with the adrenal section. There is replacement therapy for ACTH. Again, has to be done uh, by injection. Uh, and it's used primarily for diagnostic purposes, um, but it can be used for adrenal cortical insufficiency if there's a pituitary collapse or something like that. Um, that'll be very important because when we're very worried about true insufficiency of the adrenals, that can lead to an adrenal crisis, which can be fatal. Uh, people get super hypoglycemic, they lose their blood pressure, and so forth. And uh, if that happens because the pituitary is no longer secreting ACTH, that is known as secondary adrenal cortical insufficiency. If it's a problem of the adrenals, that would be primary adrenal cortical insufficiency. But usually in primary adrenal cortical insufficiency, we're gonna see high ACTH. Um, with low cortisol versus in secondary, we're gonna see low ACTH with low cortisol. And that's where the ACTH replacement therapy can come in. Um, Cushing's disease is um, a situation of high ACTH due to a pituitary tumor. Um, so we're gonna have, we're gonna see a difference here. Cushing's syndrome includes anything that causes increased cortisol. That could be taking glucocorticoids, that could be an adrenal tumor, pituitary tumor. Cushing's disease is a subset. It's a smaller set that includes um, high cortisol from a ACTH secreting tumor in the pituitary gland. So that gets confusing. People often forget to differentiate those two. Um, and then uh, interestingly, some carcinomas in the lung primarily, but also GI tract can secrete excess ACTH. Um, so those can be uh, other sources of, ACE, of increased ACTH. All right, so those would be the high and low states with ACTH. Moving on to TSH, this is secreted by thyrotropes or thyrotrophs. Um, and this, uh, the releasing hormone is TRH, thyroid releasing hormone. And again, this is released in a pulsatile rhythm over 24 hours. TRH is usually highest in the morning and so then TSH will be as well. Um, and this can be important diagnostically. We currently don't have guidelines that say we should measure TSH at any particular time of day. We do with testosterone and things like that. You have to always measure those in the morning. Um, but TSH, we usually, for thyroid screening, we do them any time of day. But it can actually vary by 50% in a day um, over that 24-hour period. So if you measure at 8 a.m. versus 3 p.m., you can have see a significant difference in TSH. And that's why I often have to kind of wonder when people are making these really big deals about these really tight lab value ranges, like, oh, TSH is a little high there, a little low. You know, we have to really be careful about that because these hormone levels vary by the hour. And, uh, you know, if you're just getting that one snapshot, it's really hard to make a lot of conclusions from that. We have to look at that in the whole context of the patient. Um, so just remember that 24 hour TSH rhythm. Um, interestingly, the TSH starts to rise actually before 6 a.m. In fact, thyroid levels actually go up before dawn, uh, and they're highest during the kind of late night hours. And so there is actually uh, a way of dosing thyroid hormone where you actually give it not in the morning like is typical. You give thyroid hormone before bed. Uh, and for a lot of patients, that works a little bit better. So we'll come back to that with the thyroid discussion. The TSH binds to TSH receptors in the thyroid gland, and uh, this releases primarily T4, about 80% T4, 30% T3 from the gland. Uh, very high develop, uh, secretion of thyroid in early life, and then that um, diminishes with age. Um, estrogen, uh, specifically estradiol, E2, increases the sensitivity of thyrotrophs to TSH, but estradiol also inhibits thyroid function in peripheral tissues. So um, estradiol can have both effects. Primarily, though, I think of estrogen as inhibiting uh, thyroid 
versus progesterone, interestingly, can uh, improve thyroid activity in the peripheral tissues. So I think of progesterone often as a thyroid supporting hormone, estrogen is a thyroid inhibiting hormone. Um, the thyroid hormone should negatively feed back to the hypothalamus, specifically T4. And this gets a little controversial about TSH ranges. So I mentioned that thyroid T4 is not active in tissues. It has to be converted uh, into T3. And there are enzymes called deiodinases, and there are three different types. And the main one is called D, uh, D2, um, deiodinase type 2. And um, this basically converts within the cell T4 to T3, and C3 has the active effects. One of the controversies about TSH ranges is that, you know, the conventional argument is that TSH is a very accurate regulator uh, indicator of how your thyroid levels are throughout the body because it's, it's really what the brain is using to, you know, turn on and off thyroid secretion. But, but some have pointed out that the um, diiodinases in the pituitary and hypothalamus act a little differently than the diiodinases in the peripheral tissue. So you could, your brain could be sensing normal T3 levels because it's getting rapid conversion from T4. But this activity might be really slowed down in your peripheral tissues. So your brain might be perceiving you're getting enough thyroid, but your liver and your muscle and whatnot might actually be really starving for thyroid because it's not being converted very quickly between T4 and T3 because the diodinase activity is different. Uh, that is a real concern, and I'll come back to that when we look at thyroid and TSH testing, um, but that's not usually talked about in the conventional circles at this point. Uh, so we still use TSH as our primary regulator uh, or indicator of thyroid levels throughout the body. Um, somatostatin, dopamine, and cortisol all inhibit uh, TSH and TRH as well. Uh, the plasma levels are... Our typical reference range is between 0.4 uh, and 4.0. That's the typical TSH range. Again, we'll talk about some differences of opinion on that, uh, but this is uh, milliunits per uh, liter, and the half-life is about one hour on TSH. The receptor, TSH receptor, is primarily on those thyroid follicular cells. Now, interestingly, human, uh, the uh, chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, is a weak agonist to the TSH receptor. So in pregnancy with high HCG levels, uh, this can actually lead to gestational hyperthyroidism because of overstimulating, overstimulation of those TSH receptors. Uh, we can also get antibodies against the receptors, which can not just bind and block, but can actually stimulate those receptors. And that happens in grave disease, autoimmune hyperthyroidism. We'll come back to that, but that's uh, those are two possible problems that can happen at the TSH receptor. Uh, the action is primarily to increase the synthesis and release of T4 and T3. Um, it can also cause hyperplasia and hyper, hypertrophy, hypertrophy of the thyroid, and it can increase the blood supply and the growth of blood vessels, the vascularization of the thyroid as well. Um, so that can lead to goiter if uh, TSH is in excess. Again, we use TSH to assess thyroid function throughout the body and when there's a circadian rhythm highest in the morning. Um, there's no TSH replacement directly. What we usually do is just give thyroid hormones um, as replacement therapy. Uh, there are some um, uh, animal studies that have used TSH, but I don't know of a TSH uh, product on the market for human use. Um, Disorders with TSH would be an increased TSH, which can, which can happen in primary hypothyroidism. So primary means the gland itself is not secreting thyroid hormone. The brain senses the low thyroid, puts out more TSH to try to stimulate the thyroid gland. So we're going to see increased TSH in primary hypothyroidism, very common in the clinic. That's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, um, and that's the most common cause in the United States, and that's due to autoimmune destruction of the thyroid. Um, we can also have a secondary or tertiary hyperthyroidism where, for example, you get a pituitary tumor that oversecretes TSH. Very, very rare, but it can happen, and that can lead to um, secondary hyperthyroidism. Tertiary would be increased CR, or, uh, TRH from the hypothalamus, from hypothalamic dysregulation. Again, very rare. Uh, decreased TSH we're going to see in secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism. Um, that's a little bit more common than the 
uh, secondary tertiary hyperthyroidism, and then in primary hyperthyroidism. Like in Graves' disease, thyroid gland is oversecreting because all those antibodies are binding to the TSH receptor and overstimulating the thyroid. Uh, we get high thyroid hormones, and that's going to decrease your TSH. So those would be your increased and decreased uh, TSH disorders. Moving on to our gonadotropins, FSH and LH. Um, just going to do a quick review here, and we're going to get into this in a lot more detail in the male and female reproductive sections. But the uh, cells to secrete these are the gonadotropic cells or gonadotropes in the anterior pituitary. And the releasing hormone is the same for each, and that's GnRH. Uh, from the PVN in the hypothalamus. Again, slow pulsations of GnRH lead to FSH, fast pulsations lead to LH secretion. Um, the stimulators for release are many, uh, primarily uh, during the female menstrual cycle. There are various things that trigger either FSH or LH. Uh, part of that has to do with an inner uh, 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 infradian clock which basically is time to the monthly menstrual cycle. And that's what uh, changes the pulsatile rhythm of GnRH in the hypothalamus. In males, there are also circadian rhythms, uh, but um, usually the effects are not as uh, noticeable in males as in females. The inhibitors of FSH would be elevated estrogen and inhibin from the ovaries. Uh, and then cortisol and prolactin also inhibit FSH. Uh, for LH, it would be elevated androgens and progesterone, and then cortisol and prolactin. Um, the estrogen and androgens, this is part of the negative feedback uh, cycle that happens during the menstrual cycle. The plasma levels will vary uh, between males and females for FSH. Generally, we measure them in milli international units, uh, and the same with uh, LH. Usually, it's between 1 and 20. Uh, international units per liter. This is going to vary though in females based on age, based on if you're in menopause, you know, ovarian function, and so forth. Um, Half-life is about three to four hours for FSH and about 20 minutes for LH. There's a receptor, FSH receptor, primarily in the ovaries and the testes. Now with more research we actually are finding that these receptors for all these pituitary tropic hormones are actually in a lot of places in the body. So it's not just the classic organs. So I'm not gonna go into all that at this point because that can get way too confusing. But just know that this is more of the classical descriptions. There's a little bit of, a lot of variation around this. Uh, the LH receptor also is found in the ovaries and the testes. Uh, FSH in the ovaries, really, it's going to be released in the, uh, if we look at the menstrual cycle, day zero is the start of menses. And let's say menses goes four or five days. And then uh, day 14, we're just putting here is ovulation. That's going to vary. Some women, that happens within seven days, some 10, some 14. Uh, and then from 14 to 28, the onset usually of the next menstrual cycle. This period is usually pretty fixed. This is the so-called luteal phase. And uh, this is the follicular phase. So what happens is uh, in the menstrual cycle, FSH, which we have here in red, uh, is going to be secreted in the highest levels in the follicular phase, and that's going to stimulate estrogen production. Uh, and then as estrogen levels go up, what it does is it actually triggers a surge of LH, which is in the purple here, and the LH surges, and that triggers ovulation. And then notice LH kind of goes down, but LH is going to be the, responsible for stimulating progesterone release in the luteal phase versus the FSH goes down, but then it's going to go back up again, and we see a little bit of a surge of estrogen, estradiol, uh, after that as well. So that's the usual timing here of, F, of FSH and LH. So think of the follicular phase as primarily under the FSH regulation, and the luteal phase is under the LH regulation. And then both FSH, LH, as well as estradiol and progesterone drop off significantly right before uh, the period. Interestingly, not shown on this picture are androgens, which actually don't drop off, they stay elevated. So we think this might be a trigger for migraines in a lot of uh, women, is the dropping of the estrogen progesterone suddenly, but the androgen levels uh, stay the same. Um, Okay, so that's FSH in uh, the ovaries, and they're going to stimulate in that follicular phase, follicular growth, specifically through what are called granulosa cells, 
and again increasing estradiol from the graphene follicles. LH in the ovaries will support what are called fecal cells and they secrete androgens and then the LH surge is going to uh, trigger ovulation and the, the LH will also trigger the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone. This should be review, but we're going to go into this again in the female reproductive physiology section in more depth to just uh, tease out all those little details. Um, in males, in the testes, FSH stimulates the Sertoli cells to secrete what's called antigen binding proteins, and that concentrates estradiol locally. First, it uh, uh, concentrates uh, the androgens, and they can be aromatized or converted to estrogens locally, and that stimulates spermatogenesis. And the testes, um, the LH stimulates the Leydig cells to secrete testosterone. So very, very generally, we can say LH again stimulates estradiol, both in males and females, versus LH stimulates progesterone mostly in females and testosterone uh, in males. Okay, so is there a replacement therapy? Yes, uh, both parental for each, and they're primarily used for infertility treatments, not so much for other things. So that's the main uh, use of LH, FSH parentally. Um, usually they're used together, uh, and they can be timed to sort of mimic a menstrual cycle. Um, increased states of FSH and LH uh, can be related to a lot of things, but primarily hypogonadism. So when the ovaries, for example, fail prematurely, and that's basically where the ovaries stop functioning before the age of 40, that's called premature ovarian failure. Uh, or after 40, uh, that would be menopause. Uh, in both states, LH and FSH can go up. There can be um, uh, congenital issues or genetic issues like Turner syndrome, where there's gonadal dysgenesis. Uh, and then P PCOS actually usually has high LH and low FSH. Um, decreased FSH and LH usually are due to hypothalamic pituitary issues. So hypopituitarism, female athlete triad, uh, and that's when uh, you know, over-exercising with malnutrition um, can actually lead to a shutting down of the pituitary secretions. Elevated prolactin, uh, a genetic disorder called Kalman syndrome. Kalman is interesting and that's where the neurons that secrete GnRH don't migrate properly uh, into the hypothalamus. And so curiously, these patients have low uh, FSH and LH, but they also have a loss of smell, anosmia. Uh, so that's Kalman syndrome, PCOS again, high LH, low FSH, and then um, gonadal suppression therapy of any sort will decrease those. Uh, so we'll get into all those details, but in, in the general, that's what would increase or decrease the FSH, LH. All right, so those are the gonadotropins. Our last major anterior pituitary hormone here is prolactin, um, and uh, these are released by lactotrophs. Uh, they're also secreted by other tissues, so prolactin is released also by the decidua uh, in pregnancy, uh, the myometrium, uh, the breast, they're also released by lymphocytes and by the prostate. So, you know, the pituitary is not the only source of prolactin, but we think of this as one of the primary sources. There's no specific releasing hormone. I mentioned that TRH augments the re release of prolactin, but it's not a primary releasing hormone. Uh, dopamine, though, is the primary inhibitory hormone, and that's released by the uh, neurons there in the arcuate nucleus. If you want to get in more detail, they're called the tuberoinfundibulum neurons in the arcuate nucleus, uh, and that's going to inhibit the prolactin release. Stimulators of prolactin will be estrogen. Uh, so estrogen states, taking estrogen, uh, pregnancy, nursing, liver cirrhosis where you're not clearing estrogen, chronic kidney disease where you're not clearing estrogen, PCOS. Uh, we usually think of PCOS as high androgens, but interestingly, a lot of those androgens are converted into estrogens, and that can... Uh, stimulate prolactin release. Progesterone also can release prolactin. Uh, hypothyroidism, so thyroid inhibits prolactin, so low thyroid states would cause increased prolactin. Nipple stimulation, uh, any stress, pain, exercise surgery, any damage to sensory neurons on the chest wall, that will all trigger the brain to release prolactin. Uh, extreme hypoglycemia will as well. Uh, we think uh, prolactin is released uh, in a fairly large dose in both males and females after orgasm, 
which can, uh, in, in fact, it's, we think actually in males it's released in larger amounts after orgasm, and that can potentially decrease the sexual, uh, the, or the desire for sex after orgasm uh, temporarily. Uh, different hypothalamic tumors can stimulate, uh, can have too much prolactin, usually by uh, having low dopamine. Uh, serotonin uh, can stimulate prolactin. And then different drugs, and this is interesting because one of the effects like we'll see here shortly of prolactin is to essentially inhibit reproductive function, including uh, libido. And uh, we think SSRIs can actually raise prolactin, and that's why one of their most uh, significant adverse effects beyond weight gain is uh, suppression of sexual function and desire. Um, and that could be through elevated prolactin. Oral contraceptives, estrogen, uh, H2 blockers, interestingly, like cimetidine and so forth, we think can um, increase prolactin release, neuroleptic medications, methyl dopa and verapamil, calcium channel blocker. Uh, dopamine antagonists would all stimulate the release of prolactin. So domperidone, uh, uh, phenothiazine, metoclopramide, reserpine, uh, this is important. This is, of course, in Brawolfia, the main alkaloid. Uh, reserpine works by depleting dopamine stores in the central nervous system, and that's how we think it has an antihypertensive effect. But it can also release prolact prolactin and then haloperidol. Um, so inhibitors, again, would be dopamine and any dopamine agonist. And this will be used for hyperprolactinemia states, uh, would be to use dopamine agonists like bromocryptine and car uh, carbegaline. Um, the plasma levels uh, in adult males is between 2 and 18 nanograms per uh, milliliter. In adult non-pregnant females, up to 30 nanograms per milliliter. And then in pregnancy, you can go way up over 100 to 200 nanograms per milliliter. Half-life's about 15 to 20 minutes. And there, the target receptor is the prolactin receptor. PRL is just a abbreviation for prolactin, PRLR, and that's located in the mammary glands, also in the ovaries, pituitary, heart, lung, thymus, spleen, liver, pancreas, kidneys, adrenals, uterus, skeletal muscle, skin, CNS, immune cells, T and B cells, and macrophages, so everywhere. And that's why, again, we're beginning to realize that prolactin has a lot of other functions beyond just the reproductive functions although those are still considered to be the classical effects of prolactin. So in the breast, it stimulates breast development, uh, increases milk production, but again, oxytocin is what's gonna allow for the milk to be ejected, the so-called milk letdown reflex. Uh, in males, physiologic levels actually enhance LH receptors in the Leydig cells in the testes, and that increases testosterone. But in super physiologic levels, both in males and females, and that would be from, for example, a prolactin secreting tumor, uh, it's going to suppress the gonadotropin, suppress GnRH, suppress FSH and LH, suppress estrogen and testosterone, and that's going to lead to hypogonadism. So in females, that might manifest as infertility and ovulation, oligo or amenorrhea, short luteal phase, and decreased libido. Uh, in males, it's going to result in decreased testosterone uh, and decreased spermatogenesis, infertility, and again, low libido. Uh, so those would be the negative effects of too much prolactin. We know prolactin also can regulate metabolism, especially with adipose metabolism. That's still an active area of research, so don't have a lot of therapeutic applications of that yet. Uh, we know it's important for immune function, uh, also cardiovascular regulation. Uh, in hematopoiesis regulation in the lungs, it increases surfactant in the fetal lungs. In the brain, increases neurogenesis and synthesis of the oligodendrocytes, the myelinating cells, uh, the glial cells. Um, so lots of other protective effects of prolactin. Uh, again, this would be in the physiologic levels, not the super physiologic, like from a tumor. Uh, there is a prolactin replacement therapy not commonly used. It can be used to induce lactation, again, by injection. Uh, disorders of increased prolactin uh, would be pretty common, and that would be the prolactinomas. These would be pituitary adenomas. We'll get into that in the pathology section, which release too much prolactin. Decreased prolactin would result from uh, hypopituitarism or excess dopaminergic activation uh, or any of the dopamine receptor agonists. Um, so um, 
And actually the agonist will be used to treat the prolactinomas. We'll look at that later. Okay, so that's a little bit about prolactin. Now let's jump over to the posterior pituitary and talk about oxytocin. Again, oxytocin is released by magnocellular cells, uh, neuro neurosecretory cells, um, in both the superoptic and the paraventricular nucleus. We think a little bit more in the paraventricular nucleus. Um, these neurons reach down into that portal circulatory system, not in the infundibulum, but right into the posterior pituitary. They can store the hormone, the oxytocin there, until it's ready to be released. Uh, we now know, though, that um, the uh, oxytocin can be released from other tissues as well. So corpus luteum, placenta can release oxytocin, Leydig cells in the tes testes, the retina, the adrenal medulla, thymus, pancreas. Again, we don't know what that means clinically, if that's important. There are no real disorders of oxytocin over secretion from these uh, tissues. Um, generally, we think of oxytocin at least in the physiologic levels, is having a very beneficial effect. Um, oxytocin does have a close similarity to antidiuretic hormones, so it can have antidiuretic effects. Um, now, the stimulators for oxytocin released, a little nebulous in the literature. We know that vitamin C is a cofactor in the synthesis of oxytocin, um, but we know, of course, that labor, stretching of the uterus and the cervix are very important stimulators for oxytocin release, breastfeeding and suckling behavior. Um, estrogen, and then we know that uh, touch, uh, hugging, holding hands, kissing, so forth, all releases oxytocin as well. Um, not a lot of information on the inhibitors of oxytocin release, but we can probably imagine stress hormones, anything that inhibits all this activity would uh, inhibit oxytocin release. Uh, various levels are cited for oxytocin. We typically don't measure oxytocin, but usually it's in the picograms per milliliter range. Um, in pregnancy, those levels go up uh, three to four times higher. The half-life is only about three to five minutes on uh, oxytocin. The receptors are the oxytocin receptors. They are G-protein receptors requiring both magnesium and cholesterol, interestingly, as cofactors. And they're found in the breast mammary gland, in the uterus, but also in the central nervous system, in the kidney, and very interestingly, in the heart and the pericardium. So again, a little Chinese medicine connection. There's a so-called uh, organ system called the pericardium, the heart protector. And we talk about there are pericardium type people, uh, and they often have problems with boundaries, but also they, for example, get into relationships for the thrill of it. And once that thrill is gone, they move on to another relationship. We might think of that thrill as really coming from oxytocin. Uh, so what connection is there with that? Not quite sure, but um, I think that's interesting that we have found oxytocin receptors on the cardiovascular tissue, including the pericardium. The actions in the breast are to increase milk secretion during lactation. Again, the letdown reflex. So it helps stimulate the contraction of the smooth muscle in the breast. Um, helps stimulate contraction of the uterine smooth muscle during labor and it's involved in cervical dilation as well. Um, but some of the other non-reproductive functions which are interesting is we think of oxytocin as a major anti-stress hormone and it increases the feeling of well-being and social interaction. Um, so this is, we can say, you know, when we talk about loneliness kills and has all sorts of negative health consequences, well, one of them is through lower oxytocin levels. Uh, so getting, doing activities to increase oxytocin could be quite helpful there. Um, we think of oxytocin as stimulating pair bonding and maternal behaviors. So uh, a lot of this comes from animal research, looking at mice and their offspring. Um, and if you keep the mother with the offspring, the oxytocin levels go up. If you separate them, the oxytocin levels go down. Um, increases dopamine release from the nucleus accumbens, which would then inhibit prolactin. Uh, decreases activation of the amygdala, which again is your major fear and anxiety center in the brain. Uh, decreases the HPA axis. Uh, decreases norepinephrine and sympathetic nervous system uh, activation. Uh, increases endogenous opioids and increases serotonin with antidepressive effects. Uh, and we have found that in autistic children, there are lower levels of, uh, uh, of oxytocin and the uh, oxytocin receptor gene, or it's not expressed adequately. Um, so those are some of the non-reproductive anti-stress uh, sort of feel-good functions of oxytocin, which is why many are referring to this as the ultimate love hormone. Um, 
there is replacement therapy that's used in labor, and that's Pitocin, uh, injectable to stimulate uterine contraction uh, at the time of delivery. Um, I didn't put disorders here because we don't really talk about oxytocin disorders, although that might be coming in the near future. All right, so that's a little bit about the first posterior pituitary hormone, oxytocin. Okay, our very final hormone to discuss, uh, and the final hormone of the posterior pituitary is antidiuretic hormone. Also goes by the name of vasopressin or arginine vasopressin, AVP. So you'll see both names in the literature. Um, it's secreted by the magnocellular neurosecretory neurons of both the supraoptic uh, and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus, primarily, again, the supraoptic. Um, it's carried down the axons to the posterior pituitary, again, stored in vesicles until it's released. Um, the um, ADH from the paraventricular nucleus is carried to the anterior pituitary as well. Uh, and it actually stimulates corticotropic cells uh, with CRH uh, to release ACTH. So we can say that when ADH is released, um, it can also trigger the release of ACTH in conjunction. Um, some tumors can also secrete ADH, like small cell lung cancers, uh, and that's going to be important as an ectopic source of ADH. Uh, and then ADH is similar in structure, again, to oxytocin, so... Um, <clears throat> Both have kind of interchangeable roles to some degree. Um, the uh, main stimulator for ADH release is uh, a detection of a change in plasma osmolality. Remember that osmolality is really the amount of uh, solute uh, dissolved within the plasma. So the main determinant is actually sodium. So we can think of sodium as kind of the main regulator of osmolality. So as sodium levels go up, as osmolality levels go up, um, that's going to activate osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, and that's going to essentially tell the hypothalamus to release more ADH, and the net effect is going to be to retain water in the body so that you dilute out the uh, sodium and the other um, solutes in the blood. Um, so this is the main effect of antidiuretic hormones. So an increase in plasma osmolality above 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. We'll get into the details with the pathology section. A decrease of arterial volume can also trigger the osmoreceptors. What happens here is in cirrhosis, nephrosis, or heart failure, you're getting edema. Um, and uh, so you're getting more tissue, more fluid in the extracellular tissues, but the arterial volume goes down. And um, so as a result, it actually triggers the osmoreceptors to fire. Um, and then an increase in angiotensin II from overactivation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Also, nausea and in post-surgical states, you often see an increase of uh, ADH secretion. Uh, inhibitors would be a decreased plasma osmolality, an increased arterial volume, um, so you get essentially more fluid in the arter arteries that are, are diluting out the solutes. Uh, alcohol and caffeine inhibit ADH release, and this is the phenomena of, you know, you are drinking, and then, you know, you suddenly have the urge to urinate, and you urinate, and now you start urinating very frequently, and that's because you've inhibited your ADH. Um, an increase of atrial natriuretic peptide, A and P, and that has to do with when the uh, there's increased arterial volume that stretches the ventricular walls and the atrial walls, you're going to have a release of ANP and BNP, which will tell the kidneys to increase diuresis, but it also will inhibit ADH and then an increase of cortisol. So all of these are the uh, different stimulators and inhibitors. The plasma levels are usually pretty small, one to five picograms per milliliter, and the half-life is about 16 to 24 minutes. I think the average is about 20 minutes. Um, there are different receptors for ADH. Again, another name is AVP. Um, so the AVPR1A receptor is located in the liver, the kidneys, but primarily the endothelium. Um, and what its main effect there is to uh, cause vasoconstriction. So ADH causes vasoconstriction that will increase blood pressure. It also increases platelet aggregation, uh, and that's partly by releasing factor 7 and von Willebrand factor, and that's going to trigger platelet aggregation. 
Um, so we can think of this as a survival kind of signal. Your brain is thinking, oh, I must be losing fluid volume, I must be bleeding somewhere, so it's gonna trigger vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation. There is an agonist for this called felipressin, uh, and this is actually a presser. So this can be used in very low uh, hypovolumic states <clears throat> to try to, and very low blood pressure states to try to raise blood pressure. Um, the AVP uh, R1B, also recently renamed AVPR3, is in the pituitary in the brain, and that uh, main action there is to increase the ACTH secretion, <clears throat> like we had just talked about. And the agonist uh, here would be uh, ADH itself, like, or again, AVP. Um, the AVPR2, these are known as the V2 receptors. They're primarily located on the collecting ducts of the kidneys, a little bit on the endothelium as well. And their main uh, effect is if you looked at the collecting duct above here uh, in the nephron, so here we have the glomerulus here, the blood flow comes in, we get the ultrafiltrate coming out. Uh, most of it's gonna be resorbed as it the fluid passes through the tubule system, and it's gonna end up in the collecting duct. Well, what the uh, <clears throat> binding of the AVP to the V2 receptor does is it essentially is going to cause the insertion of what are called aquaporin channels. These are channels for water uh, in the uh, membrane of the cells lining, the principal cells lining the collecting duct. And this will cause water then to move from the collecting duct back into the cell and then back into the body. Um, so that's gonna cause water absorption. I think it's very interesting to note that the kidney itself really doesn't regulate water, it's regulating sodium. And so by reabsorbing sodium, it's gonna reabsorb water. Uh, versus in the collecting duct, this is the only place via a hormone from the pituitary where uh, we are directly reabsorbing water by increasing those aquaporins. Uh, so that's the AVP2, AVPR2 receptor or V2 receptor. Um, the receptors on the endothelium also cause release of von Willebrand factor, which will increase platelet aggrega aggregation. Um, so uh, ADH directly is an agonist. Uh, there is a synthetic form which has a longer half-life called desmopressin. And that could be used for low uh, ADH states, like in diabetes insipidus. Um, but that uh, is uh, going to uh, mimic the effects of ADH on the kidneys. Um, the antagonists would be called the, what are, what are known as the Vaptan diuretics. So they block the V2 receptors. Tolvaptan is one example. So in excess ADHD states, those could potentially be used. We'll talk about that, the details of that as we get into the pathology. Um, okay, so what are the major actions in the kidney? The actions of ADH are gonna to be to increase the water permeability in the collecting ducts via the aquaporin II. Uh, channels, and that's going to decrease water excretion, and that's going to concentrate the urine. So you can get less uh, diuresis, more concentrated urine, but that will then dilute out the blood. That will increase plasma volume and dilute out the uh, solutes like sodium in the blood, and that will decrease the plasma osmolality. Um, it will, uh, in the kidneys, also increase urea reabsorption. In the cardiovascular system, again, the uh, ADH working through the different receptors will work on, uh, will increase vasoconstriction and blood pressure. And on the brain, uh, there's several different effects. So um, again, ADH is released in a circadian rhythm. Um, and uh, we think it has effects on increasing aggression, as well as again, increasing blood pressure and temperature regulation. There may also be some analgesic effects. So in general, we can think just kind of the big picture ADH is increasing your water body, uh, potentially helping you in the case of hemorrhage to try to prevent that from happening if you had an injury. Um, it's uh, maybe increasing survival behavior like more aggressiveness to get away from uh, a trauma or an injury or a threat. Um, and at the same time, it's sort of diluting out everything. It's having analgesic effects as well. So that's more of a big picture of ADH activity. There is a parental ADH replacement therapy, um, and that would be the uh, desmopressin, uh, and this can be used in diabetes insipidus. Uh, the felipressin is also used as a presser in septic shock, as I mentioned. Uh, 
uh, bioidentical ADH is vasopressin itself. That's called vasostrict pressin. This is used more for the vasopressive effect. It has a very short uh, half-life again, so it's only going to work very immediately in acute settings. The synthetic ADH, the desmopressin, um, is has a longer half-life and that will be used more in uh, diabetes insipidus. So the disorders of ADH would be increased ADH, that would be SIADH, um, and uh, that's going to, we'll talk about what triggers that, but that's going to be too much ADH, and then decrease would be diabetes insipidus. So that's a little overview of ADH. Now lastly, I just want to say a few more things about plasma osmolality, in case that's a little unclear to you. That's again a measure of the body's electrolyte water balance. Uh, we measure this in osmoles or milliosmoles, and that's really the number of solute particles in a solution. So osmolarity is the number of milliosmoles per liter, but clinically that's not very useful. Um, what's more useful is osmolality which is the number of milliosmoles per kilogram of solvent, and in the body, that's water. So osmolality can be determined with an osmometer, so we can actually measure it directly. And so this is actually a lab test you can get, plasma osmolality. You can also get urine osmolality. And in SIADH, and especially hyponatremia, so if you hold on to too much water in the body with SIADH, too much ADH secretion, your sodium levels will go down, giving you hyponatremia. And um, we have to be able to assess that appropriately. And one of the lab tests we'll be using is plasma osmolality as well as urine osmolality. Um, the osmolality is determined primarily by sodium, to lesser extent chloride, uh, bicarbonate, proteins, glucose, and urea. And uh, the osmolality is monitored again in the hypothalamus by osmoreceptors. Now, the normal ranges for plasma osmolality are 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. Uh, urine should be between 500 and 800 milliosmoles per liter per kilogram, although there's a very wide range going from 50 to 1400 in extreme cases. Um, now, this is very important. Again, the plasma osmolality is going to be the determinant of tonicity. And um, so if we have, for example, an isotonic solution, so if we are isotonic, that is going to allow proper exchange of water and electrolytes and so forth across cell membranes. Unfortunately, if we go hypertonic, where we have too much, we have increased osmolality, that will actually cause water to move from the cells out into the blood, and that will cause cells to crenate or shrink. Uh, versus hypotonic solutions, if we um, don't have enough uh, osmolality, that can cause the opposite, where cells will actually now absorb water and uh, they will swell, and that can cause cell lysis. So this is, of course, important for IV fluid solutions, where we have to really be careful about the osmolality of that solution. So isotonic solutions will be between 270 and 300 milliosmoles, and that will keep us in our normal plasma osmolality range. Uh, and that would be an example, that would be 0.9% sodium chloride. Hypertonic solutions would be over 300 milliosmoles, and that would be uh, dextrose 2.5% uh, in water. Um, and that might be used um, in hypertonic situations to actually remove cerebral edema, uh, things like that. And then hypotonic solutions, less than 270 milliosmoles per liter, would be uh, uh, dextrose 5% and 0.9% sodium chloride. And hypotonic solutions might be used to get fluid into cells in extreme dehydration. Again, those are gonna be more specialized uses of those fluids. Uh, so tonicity is very important for determining overall cell function, and that's why ADH has a very important role here uh, in its ability to maintain plasma osmolality. So whenever plasma osmolality increases, we're of course gonna have an increased concentration of those solutes like sodium and urea in the blood. And the water is gonna shift from the tissues into the plasma. So the cells are gonna shrink. Um, and uh, so what happens then is the osmol receptors detect that. They're going to increase ADH secretion. They're gonna increase thirst. Uh, they're gonna increase water retention via the ADH and that's gonna then dilute out the, the uh, plasma and the solutes. And so we get a decreased osmolality. It's gonna decrease urination and that's going to increase urine osmolality. Versus a decreased plasma osmolality, we have a decreased concentration of the solutes in the blood. The water is gonna shift from the plasma to the tissues, uh, 
um, and uh, the tissues will swell, the cells will literally swell. And so now ADH will be down-regulated, uh, water's gonna be lost through urination, that's going to hopefully increase the plasma osmolality. We're gonna have increased urination with a decreased urine osmolality, the urine gets more dilute, the more you urinate, and then your thirst goes down. So keep that in mind, that'll be important again for our discussion of diabetes insipidus and SIADH. Um, just a couple of other comments. You know, if you look at this graph over here, you see very clearly how sensitive this mechanism is. So, um, you know, you get above the uh, osmolality of 280, we start to see uh, ADH secretion go up here very quickly. Um, and uh, that will also quickly target, turn on the taste mechanism, uh, the thirst mechanism. So we'll start to drink more water to try to dilute out the uh, concentrated solutes in the blood. Uh, note though that blood pressure and volume are mediated by changes in the sodium, uh, and that's largely regulated by the uh, kidney system through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So we have to think of the kidney, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone as one branch of this, but then the osmolality specifically is regulated by ADH. Okay, so that is probably more than you wanted to know, but stuff you should know about the pituitary gland, both anterior and posterior. In the next videos, we'll look at uh, disorders of both the anterior and the posterior pituitary.